is Russell Morning, so you're probably familiar with him, so I will leave you with the thoughts. Let's give it a For those who didn't meet this morning, uh, I have been a member of the Django Core team for 11 years. Uh, I was president of the Django Software Foundation from 2010 to the end of 2015. Django is a part of the broader Python ecosystem, but it's by no means the only part. There are other web frameworks, to be sure. There are also, there's also a huge breadth of domain knowledge that's encoded in Python. Projects like NumPy, SciPy, Jupyter, BioPython, AstroPy. There's a wealth of scientific expertise in the Python community. Raspberry Pi and Rock Learning are leaders in the Board of Education, and as a result, Python will usually find a place on most lists of popular programming languages. And yet, despite this widespread interest in Python, Python has really only been available on server and desktop environments, devices that fit a very traditional concept of what a computer is. But over the last 10 years, we've seen the emergence of a new class of computer devices, much smaller and often portable. Things like phones and tablets and watches and set-top boxes. But if you know Python and you want to write code for those devices, well, good luck with that. If you want to write a client-side web app, you have to write it in JavaScript. If you want to write an iOS app, you have to write it in Objective-C, or more recently, Swift. If you want to write an Android app, you have to write it in Java. Now, OK, that isn't completely true. For example, you can use PhoneGap to write a mobile app in HTML and JavaScript. Of a fashion, you're not really writing a native application, you're writing a web page that can be delivered as an app. And that may suffice for certain situations, but sometimes you really just want a native application. And you could use a cross-platform toolkit like Xamarin, React Native, or Titanium, and they will get you a lot closer to a native application. The app itself will actually use native widgets. But you'll either be stuck behind the APIs that the cross-platform toolkit provides, or you'll be writing code to integrate with that native platform, which probably means writing code in native platform's language of choice. And while my personal lament here, and for the purposes of this conference, uh, my lament is about Python, this isn't a Python-specific lament. The devices that I grew up with, servers, desktops, laptops, were environments where you had access to a wide range of programming languages. You could pick the tool that suited your needs, your mental model. You want to go write an application in Prolog? Well, go right ahead. But that isn't the case with these new programming environments. You know JavaScript? You can write web apps. But JavaScript isn't an officially supported native language on iOS or Android. And if you know Java, you can write Android applications, but not web or iOS apps. And if you prefer Ruby or Haskell, well, you know, you're straight out of luck. The current landscape is one where polylingualism is required because there isn't a single language that can be used on every platform as a native offering. Now, if you're a professionally trained software engineer, that shouldn't be too much of a challenge. That's your job at the end of the day. If you're unwilling or unable to learn more than one programming language, particularly when they're all in the same sort of, uh, same sort of style, like Objective-C, Swift, Java, JavaScript, then you know, maybe it's time to reconsider your career path. But what if you're not? If you're a scientist, your day job isn't programming. Programming is what helps you get your day job done. If you're a student or someone with a casual interest in computing, well, you've got enough trouble wrapping your head around one language, let alone four subtly different ones. At present, if you want to write a mobile application that's available on multiple platforms, you have to learn several different programming languages. Polylingualism, be it in human languages or computer languages, is a good thing. There are countless studies out there that reinforce the benefits of learning a second spoken language. Improvements in perception, memory, decision making and problem solving. Polylingualism is good for you. The catch though is that the polylingualism that is required by mobile development isn't really polylingualism. It's parallelised monolingualism. Each individual device ecosystem is strictly monolingual. You don't have any real choice of language. You need to be polylingual, but you don't get any choice in your language. You don't get any of the benefits of polylingualism. This effectively means that a wide range of potential users are locked out of writing useful applications. And the demographics where, where uh, these, so these demographics are where the potential for custom mobile applications are huge. Just consider the scientific angle. Imagine the possibilities of a scientist who could easily write an application for mobile data gathering or facilitate citizen science contributions for animal sightings or climate readings. So, 
can you break out of the monoculture that these individual platforms provide? Can you provide access to native APIs or native capabilities of a device to an arbitrary programming language? Well, the good news is yes, you can. I'm going to show you how. So, let's play a game. You are a Python user. You have some fancy new hardware device that's just been dropped into your lap. Uh, what options do you have for getting Python to run on it? Well, to answer that question, we need to start a little bit higher up with a slightly different question. We need to start with what. What is Python? Well, it's a programming language, right? Well, except it isn't. Depending upon who's talking, Python could be one of two things. Python, the language, is an abstract thing. It's a specification of syntax and semantics that describes how a particular sequence of human readable bytes will be interpreted to make a computer do something interesting. Then there's the Python interpreter that you actually install and run. When you tell someone to go to the Python website and download the installer, you're not strictly talking about Python, you're probably talking about CPython, which is a de facto reference implementation of the Python language standard. This separation between implementation and specification is valuable because it means that CPython isn't the only way that Python code can be interpreted. There are features of Python as experienced by end users that are features of CPython, not the language itself. The GIL, for example, the Global Interpreter Lock, is a part of the CPython interpreter necessary for protection in multi-threaded environments. It's the bane of any discussion of Python performance, but it's not an inherent feature, or misfeature, of Python itself. It's a feature of CPython, the specific reference implementation of the Python language specification. CPython, because of the way it's implemented, needs a GIL. Other implementations of Python, uh, or the Python language specification, Jython, PyPy, Stackless, don't have a GIL. This separation means that when we're talking about getting Python run on our fancy new hardware device, there's a couple of different possible approaches, depending upon the capabilities of the device that you are targeting. The easiest approach, of course, is to just use CPython. When you start a Python shell, or run a Python script on your laptop or on your server, chances are this is actually what you're doing. You're running CPython, effectively the reference implementation of the Python language standard written in C. And one of the side effects of being written in C is that it makes it very easy to port to new platforms. In this regard, it follows the tradition that was laid down by Unix. One of the major reasons for the success of Unix as an operating system is that in the early days of computing, dozens of manufacturers were producing computers. IBM, DEC, Univac, hundreds of others. And technology was advancing so quickly that there would be major shifts in architecture between versions of a device. And each device would come with its own eclectic operating system. Then Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Brian Koenigan, and a bunch of other people working at Bell Labs worked something out. If you could define a middle kernel that could be ported to any machine, providing a common API for operations like memory management and process invocation and I.O., you can then use that kernel to bootstrap the rest of an operating system. And they then developed a programming language, C, to make this even easier. The original versions of C were developed to make it easy to port Unix to new platforms. The kernel, which was written in assembly language for specific machine, and ar machine architectures, got smaller and smaller, and the operating parts of the operating system could be easily ported to that new kernel. And that's essentially what CPython looks like when you want to port it, just at a higher level of abstraction. Uh, it assumes the existence of a C compiler, but as long as you've got a C compiler, which is a pretty safe assumption for most platforms, um, the CPython core can be compiled giving you a Python interpreter that you can run and a libPython that can be embedded. And that's a threshold that most modern devices can support. If you look in the lib directory of the Python source tree, this is what you'll find. All this of all platforms that have explicit support in the Python, uh, in, in Python source code. Python 3 pruned a bunch of these out. This, this is the list from Python 2.7. Um, but a bunch of them have been dropped uh, due to lack of interest. Yeah. OS2 EMX, for example. Anyone here actually ever use OS2? Yep, there we go. I don't expect it. But infrastructure is there, and as long as you can compile and run the language kernel, the core C Python implementation, you get the rest of the entire Python standard library and the rest of the Python ecosystem for free. But even this compilation process gives you some options. If you're using a compiled language like C, the usual approach is to write some code, use a compiler on the same machine that you intend to run that code. And if you're on a desktop or a server, that works great, because you almost certainly have a C compiler, after all, that was how you used it to compile Unix in the first place. But on some devices, 
That is implausible, either because the compiler hasn't been ported to that platform, or because compilation on device is plausible. Consider, you really want to be running a compiler on your watch. Compilation is a CPU-intensive process. Do you really want your watch turning into a molten ball of slag, burning a hole through the centre of the earth while it's attached to your wrist? Probably not. So, you really need to have a way to compile somewhere else and then get the compiled product onto your watch. And that's what cross-compilation is. A compiler is just a magic box that takes human-readable input and makes machine-readable output. But there's nothing that says that the machine-readable output has to be read by the same machine that is doing the compilation. It's just bytes at the end of the day. And yeah, okay, it is a little bit more difficult to set up and there's plenty of opportunities for things to go wrong. But these are resolvable problems. And again, Python has this ability to cross-compile built into its build system. It's a safe bet to say that almost any language whose underlying implementation is written in C will have the capability. Because if you're using C, you're almost certainly using GNU Autoconf, and the cross-platform cross -platform support is something you almost get free when you use GNU Autoconf. I say almost because GNU Autoconf is a little bit of a special snowflake. But at least in principle, the GNU toolchain has been designed to support cross-platform compilation. Remember, this is the reason C compilers exist, to make it easy to port a binary to new hardware. Okay, so as long as you have a C compiler that runs on your new hardware device, uh, or you have a C compiler that can target that device, you're set. You can compile the stock C source code and get the same C Python that you use on a server. Now, that doesn't mean that you necessarily have the same Python experience, though. If you're running Python on a watch, you can't just open a shell prompt and start typing in a new command. So you've got a problem. How do you interact with Python when you haven't got standard in and standard out? Are you stuck? Well, no, you're not. C Python is written in C, and while it's certainly designed to be invoked from the command line and provide a prompt, it doesn't actually require that. The command line experience is essentially just a wrapper around a specific collection of set up and teardown tooling. The code for the C Python executable itself is actually quite simple. It's really just a pipeline for getting keyboard input or file input, uh, passing it to the real engine, an embedded library that is called, not surprisingly, libpython. Uh, that uh, this library is what implements the actual run this Python code part of the puzzle. So as long as you can build a binary, any binary, that initializes and invokes some key methods in the Python, in, in libpython, you can have Python running on any device you want. And then it's just up to the device to determine how you pipe the Python script to the Python interpreter running on that device. Once you've got a running interpreter, you're going to want to access the system native libraries so that you can actually interact with the capabilities of the device that you're on. Now, if you've got this far, you've probably got a C compiler, which generally means you've got a C library under the hood providing some, at least some of those services. And that means you can use one of the features of the Python standard library, C types, to access those services. C types is a library that exploits the fact that at the assembly language level, the way you invoke function, what's known as the calling convention, the calling convention used by C compilers is well-defined. And since it's well-defined, it means you don't have to use a C compiler to generate code that will be interpreted as a function call. Any tool that can generate a compatible sequence of assembly language commands can invoke any function in any library, regardless of the language doing the calling or what language the library is originally written in. Now, this isn't something magic that uh, Python is doing. Python's C-type library is a wrapper around a helper library called FFI, the Foreign Function Interface. And FFI is used to provide analogous support in a wide range of languages. <coughs> uh, C types, uh, using C types as a wrapper around FFI, all you have to do is reference a C library, then describe the prototype of a C method, and you can invoke that method directly from raw Python without the need to compile anything. For example, we could use C types to load libc. libc is the standard C library on any POSIX box. We can tell that library that libc contains a function called stercher. It takes a C character pointer, C char P, and a C character, a C char, and arguments. We can say, OK, stercher so, uh, uh, returns a C character pointer. And then we can just invoke that method. We don't have to compile anything. From Python, we can access the libc implementation directly. So when a system library your platform provides, you can access them from any library with FFI support. And if you want, you can then run a wrapper library around them to provide a master API, but that's up to you and the interface that you want to provide. 
At that point, you have a fully functioning Python on your new hardware device and full access to all the system libraries. But what if those native libraries aren't written in C? On iOS, for example, or MacOS, they're written in Objective-C. Are you out of luck? Well, luckily, no. Here's a some sample Objective-C code for creating a URL object. Now, the syntax, if you come from a Python space, is going to look a little bit odd. But what we're essentially doing here is saying, OK, we're going to get the NSURL class, and we're going to pass it a URL with string message that takes as an argument a, uh, an Objective-C string that says HTTP puppy.org. Um, we're going to pass that message in. It's going to give us back a pointer to an NSURL object, which is an object that we can then use in our operations. Okay. Now, a critical thing about the uh, difference between something like C++ and Objective-C is this is done at runtime. It's not a compile time activity, which means that it maps really well to languages like Python that evaluate dynamically. So how we perform will pass this Objective-C message passing in Python. Well, a little known fact is that Objective-C is actually designed as a thin syntactic wrapper around raw C. The quirky Objective-C syntax is literally a translation to raw C function calls. So let's roll this out a little bit, remove some of the Objective-C syntax. I'll we'll start by rolling out the at symbol syntactic shorthand. So instead of using the at string, we can use a, a native C string, so without the at prefix, uh, but we'll pass it into a, to a, to a method ns string. The ns string class, we're going to allocate some memory and then initialize it with the contents of that string, and it's 16 bytes long. You get us an ns string and we'll pass that ns string as the argument for the URL with string message to your ns URL to get back the ns URL. Okay, at this point we're down to raw C double types with a C syntax. This is exactly, and I do mean exactly, the same code but written in raw C. We're going to get a class reference for ns string. We're going to get the alloc selector we're going to send the alloc message to the nsString class. We're going to get the init with strings length selector and send that message along with two arguments, a native C string and the number 16, to the str object and get back an str instance. We're then going to do the same thing with SURL, get the nsURL class, get the URL with string message and pass the URL with string message with the string that we constructed to the nsURL class. And what we get back is an ID, an object, the URL that we've actually constructed. So we have here raw C talking to an objective C runtime. If you can render all those calls with C types, you have access to the native C libraries. If you want to go even fancier, depending upon your source language, you can provide a native re language representation that abstracts the raw C API. Python is a very dynamic language, and most aspects of the way the language operates at runtime can be configured and overwritten, including basic things like attribute access. So Python uses a double underscore redundant method syntax to describe methods that have internal significance. If you define a class with a dunder getAttrib method, any attempt to access an attribute on that object will be turned into a function call on the getAttrib method. Similarly, for attempts to set an attribute using dunder setAttrib. So we've got here a getAttrib method that just prints getting attribute, and setAttribute method just prints set that name to value. If you actually instantiate that object at runtime and try and just say object or span, it doesn't matter what name you pass in, it will, it will include printing attribute, the name of the attribute you're trying to get. Now, obviously, in reality, what you want to do is actually return a useful value, but you can override that lookup process to do whatever you want. And we can use that to our advantage. If you've got an Objective-C instance, instance and someone invokes dot something on that instance, you can use that as a trigger to do a lookup on an Objective-C API, find a selector that matches, retrieve an attribute with that selector, or invoke a, a function call with that selector. There are other dumb methods that can be used to proxy the entire object lifecycle in, uh, uh, in, in Python. So you can end up with an API that feels like Python, but what you're actually doing is interacting directly with Objective-C with remarkably little overhead. Now, when this approach works, it's pretty straightforward to get going. It's the approach that makes Python available on pretty much every desktop and server that's in production. It's also the approach that I've used to get Python working on iPhones, iPads, app TVs, anything in the Apple ecosystem, basically. Um, I have, in principle, tested this on Apple Watch, but I haven't actually had a chance to play with an Apple Watch. 
Um, and although Apple hides a lot of the details behind Xcode and Objective-C and more recently Swift, the core of what they're doing on all these devices is playing old Unix and C. And so compiling C Python for iOS or tvOS or watchOS is relatively simple and you can access the native system libraries using C types. But what about when it doesn't work? What happens when you don't have a C compiler or C isn't native system language? Like, for example, with Android. Well, then you have to take a different approach. If you read the advertising copy for Android, it sells itself as a Linux and then promotes Java as a user space programming language. The catch is, it isn't actually either of those things. Yes, it is a Linux at some level, but not at any level that is interesting to us as end user developers. The kernel is written in C, and you can use a C compiler to target that kernel, but the C layer only has access to bare level system services, and you can't really do anything at all interesting from the Android as a portable computing device perspective. All of Android's user space libraries are exposed using Java APIs. And Android isn't the only platform that does this. Sun, now Oracle, spent a lot of money developing the Java ecosystem. The entire ecosystem based around the JVM as a runtime platform, abstracting away hardware, hardware differences. Now, both these platforms do a head feint in the, towards the direction of native libraries. Android provides the NDK, the native developer kit, and both Android and JVM provide something called JNI, the Java native interface. But the performance of this layer on Android is sorely lacking. And besides, the focus of the tooling of this platform is very heavily directed at using Java for user space code. If you find a third party library for Android, it's going to be provided to Java. So, yeah, you can do Python on Android on, J on a JVM using C Python as a starting point, but it's also not a particularly natural interface to the platform. Your life is going to be a lot easier if you choose to work closer to what the platform actually wants you to do. There's also platforms which just is impractical to use C Python. C Python is a great implementation of Python as a language specification for desktops and laptops. But embedded devices have some pretty extreme constraints by comparison to servers and laptops. And C Python is just too big to use on an embedded, uh, in an unmodified state on an embedded microcontroller. So you have to look at other ways of providing an implementation of Python if you want to use it. Okay, so if you've got one of these platforms and you want to use Python on it, you effectively need to provide a new implementation of Python, one that is native to the capabilities of that platform. So, how do you do this? Well, there's a couple of ways to tackle the problem. One option is to use a different compiler. C Python is obviously intended to be compiled using a C compiler, but there are C compilers out there that don't target traditional system binary executables. One such compiler is Inscripton. Inscripton is a compiler, or strictly a compiler backend, because it plugs into the parsers provided by Clang. Uh, but rather than outputting a binary that can be executed, it outputs JavaScript. Specifically, a subset of JavaScript called ASMJS that is known to run fast on certain JavaScript implementations. Remember, a compiler is just a box for turning human readable bits into machine readable bits. Nobody said those machine readable bits had to be machine language. And if you take this approach, what you get is PyPyJS, a project by Ryan Kelly. Uh, PyPyJS takes the PyPy source code rather than the C Python source code. PyPy is an independent implementation of the Python language specification that has a just-in-time compiler. So it's significantly faster than C Python. And by compiling the PyPy source code with Inscripton, what you get at the end is a block of JavaScript that will run Python code. And for suitably select benchmarks, do it faster than C Python on the same machine. Now, if you're not going to just recompile existing sources, you'll need to re-implement C Python. But you don't have to re-implement all of C Python. What do I mean by that? Well, if you pull apart a Python implementation, there's actually a couple of pieces there. Uh, the full stack consists of a parser, which takes human input and turns it into an in-memory representation of code. There's a compiler, which takes that in-memory representation and turns it into something that can be executed in C Python, that's bytecode. There's an, e uh, an eval loop which is being read and uh, which reads and runs the output of the compiler. Uh, this is to experience as the Python executable. And there's the standard library which can be used, uh, which is used by the code running to process the eval loop. The standard library comes in two pieces. There are bits that are written on the native in the native language and bits that are written in Python. The bits in the native language are either system specific, for example, hitting a native POSIX system call, or they're done natively for performance reasons. The simple approach, re-implement the lot. Write everything in Java and C Sharp, whatever other language or runtime you want to target. Those parts of the standard library that are written in Python don't need to be re-implemented, the rest needs to be just ported over. 
And that's effectively what uh, Margaret Bryson, Jocelyn, Iron Python, Skulk Bryson, and a bunch of others do. Wholesale re-implementations of all of C Python, except for the bits of the stand library that are already written in Python and therefore can be used as is. But that's not the only approach you can take. You don't have to throw out the entire C Python stack and start from scratch. C Python provides, not surprisingly, a really good parser for Python code. And it outputs a data structure that is a parsed, ready to manipulate version of the code that has been entered by a human. This data structure is called the AST, the abstract syntax tree. And its representation has been designed to be manipulated and converted. The reason the normal C Python compiler takes that AST, converts it into bytecode that can be executed by C Python's event loop. However, we can just as easily take that AST and turn it into any other representation that might be helpful. For example, Java bytecode or CLR bytecode. And that's what Voc does. Voc is effectively a cross-compiler for Python code. It's a compiler written in Python, so it can be executed by C Python, but it outputs Java bytecode that can run on any Java JVM instance. And when that Java bytecode runs, it's indistinguishable from code that came from Java source code except that it refers to line numbers in Python source files. Okay, so we can reuse C Python's parser. Do we have to stop there? Is there any more of C Python that we can reuse in our quest to get Python on a different platform? Well, yeah, if you want to, you can even reuse C Python's compiler too. When you run some Python code in a .py file through the C Python compiler, it outputs a .pyc file. That PYC file is the compiled form of the code. It's a binary representation, but not a system binary. It's not executable by itself. It's a bytecode representation. Bytecode is a bit like high-level assembly code. It's an encoded set of instructions for a stack-based virtual machine that has basic primitives like pushing and popping onto a stack, uh, setting attributes on an object, and so on. Now, this approach isn't specific to C Python either. Java, Ruby, many other languages use bytecode as an intermediate representation. So let's take a simple Python function here, sing you a little song. Uh, when you run this pro program, Python doesn't run this code. It parses and compiles this code into bytecode. Python also gives you tools to inspect that bytecode too. So the dis module lets you disassemble any function or class or whatever into its bytecode representation. So if we run dis over our method that we just defined, what we get? What you get is raw bytecode instructions. Each of these instructions is encoded in the PYC file in binary format. This is the human readable interpretation of your PYC file. Hopefully, it makes some sort of sense. We configure a loop, we set the bounds of the loop, construction offset, we load a global symbol called range, we load three constants on the stack, uh, so uh, 100, 0, or minus 1. We then invoke a function with three positional arguments. So the last three positional arguments are the last three values that have been pushed onto the stack, 100, 0, and minus 1. And the function we're going to invoke is the symbol before that, the function range. Okay, so that gives us our range value. We're going to convert that into an iterator, and then we're going to start iterating over it. We're going to iterate down to instruction 49, store a value in the variable i. We're going to load a global function called print. We're going to load a constant, which is the string uh, format, the preformatted string that we're going to run through, and so on and so on. There's nothing. Sorry. Okay. So that's nice, but so what? Well, there's nothing about Python the language that specifies bytecode. It's a runtime format used by the C Python interpreter. The C Python interpreter is what provides the virtual machine that we can actually execute that bytecode. But there's nothing to say we couldn't create an independent implementation of the C Python virtual machine capable of running C Python bytecode. And that's what Batavia does. Batavia is an implementation of the C Python virtual machine written in JavaScript. And because it's written in JavaScript, it can run in the browser. And while that might seem daunting, it's actually not that hard. After all, C Python bytecode is only 100 or so operations, a good chunk of which are basic mathematical primitives. So re-implementing it doesn't actually take that much code. How much code? Well, uh, a full Python interpreter written in Python was the subject of Chapter 12, Volume 4 of the Architecture of Open Source uh, series. In that chapter, Alison Kapsur presents a full implementation of a Python virtual machine written in pure Python. And as the subtitle of the book suggests, it's less than 500 lines of code. Now, it doesn't run fast, and there are some corners of the language spec that it doesn't touch, but it will run basic programs. You could run uh, the Python benchmark, for example. 
The biggest complication is that CPython makes no guarantees of compatibility between bytecode versions. Between 3.4, 3.5 and 3.6, there have been several major changes to bytecode formats and interpretations. But if you can stay on top of those if you want to, it's just not a major problem, it's just an inconvenience. And in the case of languages like Java, the bytecode is part of the formal language specification, so at least the changes are well documented. So what's the downside of reusing CPython's parser or compiler? Well, it means you've made a decision that parts of your stack won't run on a new platform. If you're reusing CPython's parser and compiler, then obviously that part of the stack will only run where CPython will run. You're effectively cross-compiling your Python code using one platform to produce a binary that will work on another platform. That means your target platform won't have the ability to parse or compile code on its own. It means the one thing you don't get on the new platform is a REPL, a read-eval print loop. That is a Python prompt where you can interactively type and execute Python code. Having a REPL relies upon the ability to compile code on the VOS. If you don't have an native compilation capability, you can't have a REPL. Now, that might seem like a big omission, but the platforms we're targeting here aren't natural matches for a REPL. Nobody really wants to be typing Python code into the watch. So, on these devices, Python is really about being a high productivity programming language or a domain appropriate programming language, not an interactive one. You also have to think about the entire development cycle. Remember, one of the reasons we're porting Python is so that the same code can run on multiple devices. You could develop your code on a desktop machine using C Python, the REPL, and some mocking or stub libraries. And then once the core logic of your application is working, ship it to the device for final testing. It also doesn't preclude the development of a REPL. Python is a programming language. You could write a Python interpreter and compiler in Python. Once it's pure Python, it can run anywhere that Python can run, including inside a JavaScript-based Python runtime, for example. You don't get this for free because C Python's compiler is in C, not Python. Now, whenever I tell anybody about Batavia, that one of the first reactions is often, well, why don't you just compile Python code into JavaScript code? And, yeah, okay, cross-compilation is an option. Uh, on the surface, it even seems relatively simple. Sure, there are some syntactic differences between Python and JavaScript, but most of those are cosmetic, right? And you use, you use braces, different looping construct. But if you dig deeper, it gets a lot more complex. You don't just want a language that looks like Python. You want it to run like Python as well. And Python scoping rules are quite different to JavaScripts. Let's take this really simple example. We've got two code snippets here, cosmetically the same, uh, except for language translation. First one's written in JavaScript, second one's written in Python. If you were to run that first block of code inside your browser, what does the JavaScript console display? It says 30. What about if you run it in Python, run the Python version? You get an unbound local error, because the local variable x has been referenced before assignment. Why? Because JavaScript scoping rules put X into the global scope. Python scoping rules means X can be accessed for reading but not for modification. Now, okay, short for the parents. Yes, if you use an ES6 let statement on the, on the JavaScript version or global and Python version, you'd get output parity. This is an intentionally simple example to illustrate a point. The problem gets a whole lot more complex uh, when you have structures and closures involved. So if you want to preserve Python semantics in JavaScript, you can't just do a syntax conversion. You actually have to parse the code and generate JavaScript constructs that expose the same lexical scoping as Python expects. Which means you're left with three choices. You can either re-implement Python scoping rules in JavaScript, which you can do, it's just complicated and convoluted. You can treat the resulting compiler as a Python-like language, something that looks like Python but has lots of subtle differences. Or you can pick some middle ground between the two. Turns out it actually ends up being a lot easier to implement the bytecode machine because all you have to deal with is a single stack of variables. And although I've used JavaScript as an example here, the same rules apply to any language on or output. Unless you've got a language where all of the language semantics, scoping rules and so on are identical, there will be cases where translated code will either be messy or have a different interpretation to the target language. That said, language translation can work. Google is using uh, translation to convert Python to Go in their project Grumpy. So depending on your needs, maybe it will work, excuse me, maybe it will work for you. Okay, so at this point, either by re-implementing or borrowing from C Python, you've got a parser, a compiler, and an email loop. So you can run Python code, but only Python code. There's still two big pieces missing. Standard library and getting the code onto the device. And these two big pieces are also the pieces where the engagement of language communities and platform providers has the potential for the most impact. 
The C Python standard library is made up of two parts. There's a pure Python part and a part written in C. The bit that's written in pure Python is easy. You just take that, compile it, use it wholesale. It's Python code, so it compiles as Python code, same as everything else. And we can compile it through byte code and run it through our new virtual machine or cross-compile it on a new target platform or just rerun it on our re-implemented Python, whatever you need. But the bits written in C are a little bit more complicated. There's a couple of reasons why you might want to have a module written in C. There are occasions where what you're doing is talking directly to system services. There are modules that are implemented in C because there are wrapper around some underlying library. And there are parts that are done for performance reasons. And things like that, that's so great to see Python as an implementation of Python. Nobody's going to complain about more performance. But if you're looking at C Python as a reference implementation, it's a little bit annoying because it means that you have to suddenly have to re-implement natively. What is really needed here is a coordinated approach, starting with a reference standard library. In Python's case, an implementation of the Python standard library that's written entirely in pure Python, except for a clearly delineated minimal interface to system services. This is something that can be developed externally, but it will be a lot easier with the engagement of the core language team. Getting that kind of engagement can be a problem, though. The last piece of the puzzle is deployment. It's all well and good to have code, even to be able to run it, but if you can't deliver it to end users, then all this other work is a bit of a moot point. Ironically, this is an area where new platforms might actually, might, have, uh, uh, might actually provide a way to make things easier rather than harder. In the web world, which is considered one of Python's strengths, Python's deployment story is a bit of a mess. You can't just ship someone on your code. You have to worry about web server configuration and mechanisms for activating virtual environments, which aren't too daunting once you know how all the pieces work, but it's certainly a long way away from one-click deployment and a lot more daunting than many first-time developers are ready for. And as hard as it is to believe the situation on desktop is worse, you want someone with a Windows computer to run your Python scripts, well, you know, good luck with that. Better hope they've got admin access, know how to find the dialog hidden three levels deep in control panel that lets them set their path variable, because all Windows users know how to set path variables. But on mobile devices, these devices don't have a control panel. If you want to distribute an app, you don't have a choice. You have to package them as a standalone bundle with a simple entry point. This forces us as developers and the developing community to think about how we bundle our apps for distribution and the tools we use to make that possible. But it also simplifies the packaging task. Precisely because the language environment is monocultural, all you have to do in order to deploy these platforms is work out how to fit uh, your language into their runtime. In the case of Python, that can be a simple writing templated Xcode and Android project into which you can drop your Python code. The engagement of platform maintainers, it could be even simpler, but that would require the engagement of companies providing the platform we're deploying to. Ideally, what we need is for vendors to specify the black box in which the code runs, not the tools that you use to generate that black box. But getting that kind of engagement is probably a pipe dream. So, what does the future hold? Well, we're definitely living in interesting times. For one thing, the future of Java at the centre of the Android universe isn't clear at all. Given that Java is the hill where Google has built their castle, well, the only ongoing legal battle between Oracle and Google over Java, it's going to be an interesting couple of years. Um, Google's announced Kotlin as a new language alternative, but it's still running on Java Virtual Machine. It's, it would be interesting to see if they'd pick an open approach that would allow any language to participate in this ecosystem, but signs aren't, don't, don't, make, seem that make, don't make that very seem very likely. On the other side, there's Apple. Apple has open sourced Swift and it's been ported to Android, but it doesn't run on the web. And none of the interesting parts of Swift, the system libraries, the foundation libraries, have been ported. So essentially, what we've got with Swift is the same situation that we had with Objective C 25 years ago. We've got an open source language, which is wonderful, but no, no libraries to support it. On the web, there's JavaScript, and there's JavaScript. Um, JavaScript as a language standard is finally knocking off some of the rough edges that's plagued it for years. Um, the prospects of getting other languages in the web environment are slim but growing. Getting the four browser vendors to agree on CSS has been hard enough. Getting them to add another official language or language flexibility would be a near impossibility, except for WebAssembly. WebAssembly is the next step after ASM.js, having determined a subset of JavaScript that runs fast the W3C have come up with a binary format for transmitting that JavaScript in an efficient, pre-parsed way. This has the potential to speed up the delivery and execution of JavaScript code, but also makes it easier to target other languages into JavaScript runtimes and to have those runtimes be efficient. You'll be able to write your bytecode interpreter directly in WebAssembly or write a C implementation uh, or any other Spring supported version, compile it to WASM, 
the take the VOC approach, compile your scripting language directly to WebAssembly. And this is a standard that's now been, uh, it's in Chrome uh, final, it's in a development version of Firefox and um, uh, Safari, and it's on the roadmap for Edge. So it's actually going to be in all the browsers we use. But it's still a work in progress. Watch this space. There's a famous XKCD comic about having 14 competing standards. So someone proposes a standard to unify them. So now we have 15 competing standards. Uh, the market around mobile devices has developed a series of monocultures. And this has happened for a reason. Vendors who are trying to make their own lives easy. Uh, so they've, only, they've chosen to support a single language. And they have, for the most part, picked tool chains over which they have some control. They get a little bit of vendor lock-in for good measure, and as a result, every platform is made in a different language bit. I don't think we're ever going to see a single language that is officially supported everywhere. Nor should we necessarily aim for this. While my focus is very strongly in the Python world, I don't for a second want to claim that Objective-C or Swift or Java or Ruby, Script, uh, Ruby or JavaScript or Haskell or any other language should be replaced wholesale with Python. There will always be a place for learning other languages. There will always be a place for esoteric languages, experimental languages, domain-specific languages, or languages aimed at beginners. My argument is that the monolingual silos of software development promoted by iOS and Android and the web as a whole aren't good for the industry. Many of the areas where Python has gained traction in science, in education, these are areas where mobile has the potential to make a huge impact. These people engage in these subject areas. They're not stupid, but they also don't have an interest in learning four complex languages just so they can put an application in their hand. As an industry, we need to reach out, broaden our horizons when it comes to considering who might be using our technology and for what, and wherever possible, encourage our vendors to do the same. In the meantime, it's up for us as software developers to provide these tools and work out how to provide the options that official vendors want to provide. And as I showed today, it's not that hard to do either. But without funding, Beware is going to continue to be a hobby project. Uh, that constrains the rate of development. I'd like to see it become a whole lot more. Like I said this morning, I'd like to see it become a model for a new style, financially viable, socially responsible, open source organisation. Uh, for $10 a month, you can join the Beware project as a member. Uh, I can find 10,000 people in the Python community who want these tools and are willing to support the development, I can start working on Beware full time. If I can find more than 1,000, then we can start to do social good as well. If you're interested in anything I've spoken about today, you can get to it from the pybe.org website. Uh, there's links off to the various Beware projects and a few that I didn't mention today that are related. Um, if you'd like to support the project financially, there are project memberships available. If you want to get involved contributing, we're an open source project. We have an open offer for mentoring and we're here for the spread tomorrow. And thanks to Revolution Systems, anyone who does make a contribution uh, gets the Shard Challenge coin. And with that, we probably have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. that is produced by, for example, um, for iOS, is a completely acceptable iOS application that can be pushed into the App Store. So it is, from the perspective of Apple, uh, it is a Python dot framework that has a C code that invokes the Python dot framework and then invokes a bunch of other script code. Uh, in terms of, so it, is, it is a normal application in every other sense from that level. The only thing that might stand in the way is the, uh, the app, app, uh, app Store review process. Uh, there is, uh, however, a specific exception, exception in the App Store review process uh, to say that you can, uh, you don't have to write your application in Objective-C or Swift, um, and you can use a scripting language, provided that all the code that runs is either in the application bundle at time of delivery or is entered by the end user. So effectively, all they want you to not do is ship an empty stub application that then downloads the rest of the application somewhere else. So you can't do an end run around the app, app store, essentially. Um, but as long as you meet those requirements, yeah, it's a completely legal, legitimate iOS application. And same for, uh, for Android. So Pyv uh, enables users to you know, write native code in iOS, Android, and things like that. 
Correct. There's sort of two levels at which you can answer that question. One is the full cross-platform way, which is write your code once, have it work everywhere. And the other is, I want to write a, an iOS application specifically, but write it in Python. If you're just doing the second one, writing an iOS application in Python, you can open up your iOS textbook, here is my sample iOS code, and the, the syntax for invoking all the Objective-C is different but the, it's, it's essentially, instead of using square bracket notation, you're using dot function notation. Um, so once, once I was to teach you the, the three things you need to know about how to write that code, uh, you could take any Objective-C example and run it on iOS, and similarly for Android. So if you're running against the native APIs, you can use the native documentation and then just do a mental translation. Okay? So, so you have to um, also learn a little bit about Objective-C or Swift. Uh, yeah, although the, the, sort of the, if you look at like the, the, the Objective-C documentation, what it says is there is a message that is you know, uh, in it with string. Okay, well, how do I invoke a message called in it with string? It's object dot in it with string, open brackets, argument, close bracket. Um, it doesn't give you the syntax in the Objective-C documentation. It just says that's, you know, this is the name of the method and you're expected to understand how to use that. Um, so combination of that, that sort of light documentation for what is the Python interpretation of that message is all you really need. Uh, in terms of the cross-platform, that's a whole other thing. That becomes a much bigger issue where you then have to define, like, I'm going to write a Pythonic API for accessing GPS services, for example. Um, then that API itself needs its own documentation and under the hood is then expected to do things efficiently. Um, that is still very, very early stages for what PyB is doing, but is where we're actually ended up. So at the PyCon US a couple of weeks ago, we gave a tutorial um, single source code, 30 lines of code for a Fahrenheit to Celsius converter deployed in 20 minutes between uh, iOS, Android, um, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and a single page web app. Um, but that then comes down to the documentation for Toga, which is the cross platform toolkit, as an entity itself. Okay. okay? So, so the, um, the, 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 the system API is providing ID. You, you, you're going to have. Uh, a Python documentation rather than those maybe Swift documentation or Android. You you provide your own for iOS, for Mac OS, for Windows. Uh, okay, not for for the cross-platform version, yes. Not for the platform-specific version, but I think we're out of time. If you want to run this through? I can happily yeah, go through details. Yeah, and if you're really interested in how the different Python projects work, please come to our conference. Okay, thank yep. you.